Welcome to Chatter. I'm David Priest. This week, political scientist and author Stephen Dyson on science fiction and international relations. What science fiction does is it says, imagine a world in which these things existed that was set up in this way. What can you now deduce about the world of your experience? And I would say international relations theory at its best is doing the same thing. I was stunned when I was researching the original production of Star Trek to find out that one of the major dramas they had in even getting the first episode on screen had to do with Spock. And Spock had pointed ears. And the the message came back from some of the networks, well, that's a devil then. This has been a classic role that science fiction in particular has played in American culture and and in other cultures is to put on screen uncomfortable truths or moral dilemmas that are, that are very, very difficult to, to tackle head on. Stephen, welcome to Chatter. Thank you. It's, uh, thanks for having me on. This is a strange moment for me because I've been listening to you talk for some time, uh, primarily through your, your YouTube channel that you do with Jeff Dudas also at University of Connecticut the uh, Yukon Popcast, where you talk about issues of primarily science fiction and film and TV and how it crosses over into politics, but you've expanded that a bit more more recently. So but, I'm but used also to Taylor listening. Swift was it the was it the Taylor Swift one that drew you in? Because I wouldn't that got say the most it views. drew me <laughs> in. In fact, I wouldn't say it got me to click at all. But I understand that she's a popular singer. Is this correct? This was my understanding too. That was Jeff's um, Jeff's contribution. He said, we should talk about Taylor Swift. Everyone loves Taylor Swift. And the truth is it's got about a hundred times more views than <laughs> than anything else we did, even though it has nothing to do with politics. But that's that's the internet for you. It is. I am very aware of Taylor Swift. I'm not a, what is it? Swifty? Swifter? Uh, but, s- uh, yes, Swifty. But there there are members of my extended family who who are and have been to one of her recent concerts and described it as a quasi-religious experience, and that's good for them. You know, if you can expand your understanding of our existence in this universe through Taylor Swift and her live music, good for you. I have not listened to that episode, and I'm not going to lie. I probably won't. (laughs) That's fair enough. (laughs) It's not, it's not in my, my happy place. So my happy place is a lot of the other stuff you've, you've focused on, which is the TV, the film, the science fiction, the fantasy, the The stuff that a lot of us watch for entertainment, and I I guess it's not just political scientists like us, but probably sociologists and economists and, of course, philosophers. But I'll bet you there's a whole bunch of fields of study where people watch entertainment and can't help themselves thinking about, wait a minute, you know, that's that's not how this part of the economic system works or you know what, that's not how in-group dynamics would play out in this situation. And they can't help but apply their expertise to this, even though they know it's it, the media is for entertainment. Yeah, I, I I think that's right, and I I agree with you that the the prime goal of in the case of what we're talking about today, you know, science fiction and fantasy on television and film is is entertainment. But I'd also suggest that they, these things are part of a broader cultural conversation uh, about how societies try to make sense of themselves, try to make sense of their politics, try to make sense of like uses of power, the way that people relate to one another. And so I would suggest and, and sort of have suggested in my work that there is not such a clear dividing line between the, the sort of scholarly or professional study of power dynamics and how they might be portrayed in a, in a fictional setting. Let me phrase this carefully, because I know there are some very strong opinions on this, but do you come at the field of what I've called science fiction and fantasy with a strong belief as to whether we should just call it all speculative fiction or whether there are important distinctions between science fiction and fantasy. When I grew up there, there certainly was, um, it was seen about what was, what was possible in our universe versus what wasn't. And, you know, whether it was more reflective and a metaphor for what we were doing or whether it was more wide open creative, but do those distinctions really matter? Yeah, so the the sort of omnibus phrase would be kind of speculative fiction that would encompass both science fiction and fantasy, and there are plenty of people who who are interested in both and who like that phrase. The main kind of lines of distinction would be science fiction would 
would tend to be more um, focused on things that are actually possible within the kind of laws of physics as we understand them and that maintain a, a sort of very consistent set of rules within the universe uh, as to how how the particular created universe works. Whereas there's a much greater play for things like magic and the supernatural in fantasy, which for people who like science fiction kind of rules fantasy out of being a, a you know particularly useful way to comment upon uh, society. I mean, I like both. I think they're both useful. You do have to be kind of cognizant of the differences and, and just be cognizant of how you're using the worlds uh, that you are using. There is an argument that fantasy can be somewhat regressive or um, kind of small c conservative, uh, largely because it's it's often said in the past, the focus on magic kind of r- reduces the degree to which ordinary people can kind of set their own destiny. And so people become kind of subjects more than agents of their own fate. And it tends to deal a lot with kind of castles and princesses and and nobilities and and again things that maybe reduce reduce the agency of of ordinary people. So, you know, the, the, there is that to be cognizant of. But I, I I like both. I probably do lean towards science fiction a, a little more than than fantasy, though. I remember as a teenager, you know, reading as much science fiction and fantasy as I could, and hearing that distinction. Right, science fiction is about the laws of physics, the way we understand them, even if technology is advanced, it's consistent with our understanding of how the world works. And then you go tell a story as opposed to fantasy, which is you just make shit up, right? You can do, you can do magic. You can do anti-grav, well, anti-gravity is in science fiction. So I guess part of that is my question that I remember even as a teenager thinking, well, if the way that they can have all these galactic explorations is by pressing the faster than light button, at least what I learned in junior high, high school physics was that travel faster than the speed of light kind of doesn't make sense. And it's just a device in science fiction to say, yeah, we've solved that. Well, how is that any different than magic, right? Going back to Arthur C. Clarke, how is that any different from magic? And does science fiction and fantasy kind of break down whenever you take those liberties? Yeah, that's, I mean, that, that is, that is a point that would be made by a person who who wanted to work in both fantasy and science fiction or who wanted to kind of rescue fantasy from being dismissed as uh, just magic and nonsense uh, by people who talk about science fiction. I mean, what you really want is for the, the work of speculative fiction to have an effect upon the reader so that the reader can see the connections between the created world and their own world. And there's a scholar of science fiction uh, called Darko Suvin who calls this the cognition effect, right? We can, you can you can see in the created world cognitively the links between that world and the real world, and it's that that gives the created world the ability to say important things politically or socially or whatever about the real world. And if you wanted to dismiss fantasy, you would say the cognition effect is destroyed by the introduction of impossibilities such as magic or or like the Force in Star Wars is a classic example that for some people rules Star Wars out of being science fiction and puts in the fantasy realm. But there are those who who work in fantasy who say the cognition effect is just a, a convincing literary strategy. And you can be convincing in the the way that you present magical interventions. And th- that world, as long as it's sort of internally consistent, can still have important things uh, to say about our own world. I'm, I'm interested in, in in speaking with you about this in the context of international relations, right? My field of study, and you've looked at various aspects of political science, but focused on international relations in your book, Otherworldly Politics, where you explicitly look at what the study of international relations tells us about Star Trek, Game of Thrones, Battlestar Galactica, and the reverse, what those those can teach us about it. But I don't want to limit it necessarily to those, because I think there are some broader themes here that may just come up as we chat. But I do want to go back half a step because you weren't always the guy who was combining international relations and political science with the study of speculative fiction, science fiction, fantasy. I think you'd said that it goes back a little bit more than 10 years, though, when it became more explicit, when you were teaching in, of all places, China. Uh, What happened when you were there and how did that really crystallize your interest in looking at this intersection? Yes, I used to be a very respectable and serious uh, political scientist, and then uh, <laughs> then walked off this cliff um, uh, into <laughs> into science fiction. <laughs> uh, so what happened was I was invited to go uh, teach in China um, over the summer, and this actually ended up being uh, kind of a four summer 
long thing. And I'd go out for six to eight weeks and would teach uh, Chinese national undergrads. I mean, the wrinkle were these were all people who were enrolled in American kind of four-year degree programs, and they wanted to take summer school and, and have the credits kind of count towards their American degrees. But simultaneously, they, of course, wanted to go home and see their family and, and friends and so forth back in China. And the, the problem they had was that summer courses taken at Chinese universities were not necessarily going to transfer credit-wise to, to American universities. And so I started working for this company that hit upon the, in retrospect, genius idea of just shipping out a plane load of <laughs> uh, US-based uh, professors to work at Chinese universities and kind of offer this summer school. And it was this, this just most incredible experience. I mean, I'd never been to, to China before. I ended up going to Beijing twice, Nanjing, Shanghai. Um, so, so I had a, a particular view of China. You know, these are kind of, kind of coastal major metropolitan cities, but still was completely different than anything I'd ever come across in the past. Absolutely amazing kind of life expanding experience. More specifically, what happened was I got in the classroom and I started teaching Introduction to International Politics, which, you know, every IR professor will tell you is the class that you just teach every year of your life to the point that you you sort of go insane because you're like, didn't I just talk about Woodrow Wilson like last week? And it was actually a semester ago. And you know, you, you you kind of know these lectures off by heart because you're just teaching it again and again. And I started doing my same old, what you might uncharitably call bullshit um, <laughs> out, in, <laughs> out in China. And it just wasn't having the, the normal effect. And I was being met with kind of blank faces and, and uh, stares of, un, uh, of incomprehension. And it was nothing at all to do with, with language skills. I mean, my Chinese skills were zero, but, but my students' English skills were absolutely superb. So that wasn't the barrier. It wasn't a linguistic barrier. The problem that we had was, first of all, international relations is, although, although it works on quite simple ideas, it actually uses quite a confusing and complex set of terminology and quite a sort of discipline-specific terminology. You know, you talk about neorealism in international relations, and that means one thing. Well, you, you, you go down one floor to film and media studies and neorealism, something else entirely. So, so even, stu you know, students within the same national context get kind of tripped up by, by these, this kind of terminology. And also the, the sort of received view of history in China and the United States is not the same. And if you want to explain Woodrow Wilson as an idealist and tell the story of the First World War and after, as I was doing from a Western-centric lens... You, you did not have the same reading of those events and the same historical background as Chinese students did, even if you were working with undergrads who knew a lot of history, which, which is not universally the case. And so I kind of pondered this problem, you know, how am I going to communicate these ideas of, of international relations in this, this different cultural context? And I was walking around the city and I saw uh, young Chinese people wearing T-shirts saying things like House Stark or House Lannister. And, you know, it turns out that Game of Thrones was really big in China at the time for some, you know, pretty understandable cultural reasons, right? If you, if you watch any Chinese television channel, you're presented with dragons and <laughs> castles being stormed and dynastic struggles and, and so forth. And, and so Game of Thrones just seemed like a spectacularly well-produced version of some actually quite familiar uh, cultural tropes and, and modes of storytelling. And so the, the next time I went back to China... I started using examples that I'd drawn from speculative fiction more broadly. I mean, Game of Thrones, because I was trying to meet the students where they were at, and it was currently the most popular uh, show, um, you know, but also Star Trek and Battlestar Galactica and Star Wars and some of, these, some of these other texts. And that was a lot more successful because you could kind of short circuit this differential understanding of history or, uh, and, and, and the terminology as well was a lot easier to get around when you were not talking about um, mutually assured destruction and weapons of mass destruction. But you could say, hey, Daenerys Targaryen's dragons, like they're really powerful, aren't they? Let me tell you about the strategic logic there. Well, there's one thing related to this that I will bring up and then I will dismiss because we can't talk about it in any depth without massive spoilers. And even though it's not new, the novel, The Three-Body Problem and its sequels, Chinese science fiction uh, remarkable book. And I had, for some reason, just not gotten to it for many years. And I recently picked it up and, and just couldn't stop. I found it to be uh, really eye-opening in some, in some important ways. You've actually done some academic analysis of it and related it to some issues 
of international relations, but I, I don't want to give it away because I don't want to take away that joy that I had recently discovering it. I don't feel the same way about Star Trek, the original series, because that's been around longer than I've been alive. And even the Star Wars movies, I think we're pretty safe getting into now and giving away some spoilers um, about some of the things that happen. So let's focus. Can, can we say who Luke's father is? Do you, do you think oh, that's safe? Yes, but but was his mother actually Taylor Swift? You get that a good I point. <laughs> watch, watch the Yukon Popcast episode on Taylor Swift. There, there you go. And find yeah. out. <laughs> yeah. So let's let's jump in first with you know the themes and then we'll apply star trek and perhaps star wars and others to this but how can science fiction and fantasy um, help us understand international relations what are the ways in which you know focusing on these actually does help you do that yeah so i so i think there's there's several ways um one way is just a basic sort of engagement of people's interest. <laughs> and that's sort of the the the, the basic uh, barrier that people have to cross to understand anything is to be interested in it. And this is something that's always foremost in my mind as a as a teacher, because you can't teach students anything if they if they're just not not engaged. And so there's kind of a, a vivic vivification of the source material, I think is is very, very important. Um I think an, a, another way that science fiction and fantasy can help us in understanding international relations um, is by kind of clarifying some of the underlying relationships that are going on um, in particular historical episodes or, or in theories of um, international politics. You tend in, in storytelling on screen to get a, a, a sort of privileged view at the way that decision makers are making decisions in a way that you you often don't uh, in the real world you know vladimir putin is is not going to tell us exactly why he invaded ukraine he'll give us this mixture of um you know rhetoric and and maybe there's some truth in there somewhere and you know a bunch of disinformation as well maybe some post hoc justification because he didn't have an exact reason and calculus laid out i think there's this uh especially in political science we tend to have this belief that we, we are able to determine someone's exact motives. And the more you study psychology, the more you realize, um, no, a lot of us make up the reasons after we've decided what to do. Yeah, exactly. All, all we're just completely, uh, all, all the reasoning is done kind of pre-consciously and emotionally. And, and then your, your brain comes up with some, <laughs> some sort of explanation. You think, well, that sounds sensible. That must have been why I did it. Whereas in sort of narrated stories or in science fiction and, uh, and fantasy, the whole point is to take you deep into the true motivations and the true decision making of the of the protagonists. Um, so, so that I think is is a very very important kind of benefit that that this way of working can give to us. You can also touch kind of hot button issues, and this is this has been a classic role that science fiction in particular has played in American culture and in, and in other cultures is to put on screen uncomfortable truths or moral dilemmas that are, that are very very difficult to to tackle head on and that would be kind of politically controversial. I mean, there are, you know, maybe we'll get into it later, but the, there's, there are plot lines in Battlestar Galactica in which the people who are representing the Americans adopt suicide bombing as a, as a method of resisting um, overwhelming force. And certainly at the time, you know, certainly 15, 20 years ago when Battlestar Galactica was on screen, it, it would have been hard in a classroom, let alone on network television to kind of entertain the thought that, you know, um, uh, Americans would do such a thing or to try and see the world from the standpoint of a kind of suicide bomber. But when you call people the colonials and the other side of the Cylons and it's all set in space, well, you can have actually a much deeper and richer um, understanding or, 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 sorry, accounting of uh, what might be going on there. So there, there are at least some of the, the ways in which science fiction and fantasy can help us here. Hmm. Well, I do want to get to, to some Battlestar Galactica because it is such a remarkable and let's be clear, we're talking about the more recent TV series, not the first one. And I have not seen what was the follow on Caprica? Was that the name of the? Yeah, Caprica was Caprica was was not as compelling. I didn't I didn't think um, it was like it was like a follow on, but 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 in in universe like a prequel. Although maybe it would be more compelling now because it was about the kind of crossover point where artificial intelligence <laughs> becomes sentient and kind of takes over the the world. So maybe, maybe we should all rewatch that to see what the next ten years is going to be like. I, I have it. I have it well down on my list, but now you're making me think I need to to move it 
farther up the list, still ahead of, of Taylor Swift, but on the list nonetheless. But we're talking about the the BSG that's more recent, not the one with, oh gosh, who was in that? Dirk Benedict and- Yeah, um, Richard Hatch. Well, Richard, Richard Hatch, Hatch, who played yeah. Apollo, was was in both. Um, cause right. he played, uh, you know, he was the lead, one of the leads in the, um, in the original, the kind of seventies one. And then he played, uh, Tom Zarek, who was this kind of Marxist revolutionary in the, in the reboot. Yeah. So we, hopefully we'll get there, but I do want to start with Star Trek, both because it, uh, temporally it makes sense to start with something that was in the 1960s on television. Um, and primarily talk about the original series, although I want to get into the next generation and some of the films a bit as well, but Let's go back to the the world building part, first of all. So Star Trek, watching the first few episodes, you get that there is a federation of planets. Um, it's pretty obvious that there's uh, humans from Earth, presumably, and there are Vulcans who are remarkably uh, human-like, um, just some slightly different features due to the budgets at the time, probably more than anything else. Now, it's a federation of planets, Later on, as episodes go on, you learn about many other species. But early on, you don't know how many there are. You just know that there is some kind of governance structure that is beyond Earth. But what else do we really know about the Federation of Planets and where the power centers are and and how all of the things we study in political science from domestic politics to international relations well, how they play out in the Star Trek universe based on the original series? Yeah, it's it's a very good question, and the answer I think even at the even at the time of the inception of Star Trek would would depend upon who you who you asked. I mean, Gene Roddenberry, the the creator of Star Trek, and he was by the way absolutely insistent that he be referred to as the creator, like in, in capital letters and so forth. A little bit of an ego there, apparently. <laughs> um, but he he had a very defined idea for what the Star Trek universe was. And he, I mean, throughout his life, actually increasingly so as, as he got older, he saw this universe as a um, evolved, idealistic universe and the Federation as a non-militaristic kind of um, exploratory, science-based, science and exploration and diplomacy-based organization. Um, and, and that was Roddenberry's vision for Star Trek. And his sort of premise, his world building premise was that humans would have improved just, just over the, the course of history, you know, that we were on a certain trajectory when Roddenberry was, uh, was alive and maybe some of the best values in humanity were, were kind of expressed by the, the best of the United States, you know, in, in its, in its own self-conception as kind of the leading light for freedom and so forth. Um, and humanity would over time kind of evolve beyond the distinction between people who live in different nations um, and would would kind of come under a, a, a one world government, and then the logical thing to do after that would be to start exploring other nearby worlds, and then of course these essentially American ideas, you know, <laughs> uh, democracy and uh, you know uh, uh, the, the the way that you you kind of take your values out into the universe would be would be universally appealing to to people of all different civilizations or most people of all different civilizations, and they would essentially federate themselves uh, into a structure that was somewhere between the United States and the United Nations, just on a, a kind of galactic scale. And I think that was the analogy that Roddenberry was was operating on, at least, uh, at least as regards the kind of governance and politics of the Federation itself. And when we think about that, Stephen, that, that has some truthiness to it. Like, it seems like well, well, yeah, if you're if you're technologically advanced enough that you're able to get between star systems in a reasonable time frame, that you're probably advanced enough that you haven't blown yourself up, which implies some kind of coordination and cooperation above the level that Homo sapiens have been at for most of their history. So I, I guess that sounds right, but that's not the only way that science fiction creators have conceived it. I mean, you had some of Arthur C. Clarke's novels where it was a very competitive environment, right? Up to and including, I think, 2001 with, you know, the Russians, the Chinese and the Americans all exploring into space instead of consolidating into a federation, even on Earth first. Um, we've already mentioned the three body problem where there's a very different take about trying to reach out to communicate with others in uh, in the galaxy 
and different countries were doing very different, very secretive approaches to it. So it need not be Roddenberry's vision, even though that's probably the easiest, right? As, as, a, as a set foundation for a series is, yeah, we've kind of resolved all that. So I don't have to tell stories about earth politics, but I can use all the stuff these guys, and they were mostly guys, are going to do in space to really retell those stories of everything from you know, World War II to realism versus idealism and all of these other issues. Well, that's it. And the although that was Roddenberry's idea for the for the Federation, he and the people he worked with, and I think it's important to acknowledge that the the world building process in Star Trek was Roddenberry has the idea, but many of the episodes were written by other writers. And this would this would be a constant kind of source of tension that that Roddenberry would want the stories to be one way, and writers would bring in other stories that very often had had very different views of how things would work, not only in space, but but very different kind of reflected views on what the United States was um, at the time. So the kind of a lot of the conflict and difference in the Star Trek universe was brought in by people other than Roddenberry. Um, but even Roddenberry himself acknowledged that you, could, you couldn't really have a TV show that was just about these perfect humans who went out into space. I mean, what's the dramatic arc every every week, you know? Hey, you know, uh, hello, aliens from another world. We're America. It's great. Do you want to be our friend? Cool. All right. That's that then. I mean, that that would be <laughs> kind of a dull, a dull kind of TV series. Although, although Roddenberry did try that with the first season of the the Next Generation, <laughs> um, which, which had predictable results. But but in the Star Trek universe, you you had these other powers that represented different kind of political forms and and allowed for conflict with the with the Federation. You know, most famously the Klingons and the and the Romulans. Um, which actually gave you a fairly precise analogy of uh, the Cold War kind of international system circa the the 60s and the 70s, if you assumed that the Klingons were supposed to be a rough analog of the Soviet Union and the Romulans in some in some sense a rough analog of the the Chinese. Mm -hmm. Now, later on, there have been the people, uh, including uh, officially sanctioned things within the Star Trek universe that have, you know, had the ultimate guide where they have maps of you know, territories of these, the Klingons versus the Romulans versus what Cardassians and others eventually. But at the time of the original series, you didn't have that, right? The first few episodes there, there weren't Klingons, there weren't Romulans early, very early on. And you didn't really have a sense of it. And so what, what we had was the USS Enterprise clearly modeled on Navy and like you said, it was science and exploration. You know, the voiceover at the beginning is all about brave new worlds and going and exploring things. But yet it's pretty clear pretty quickly on that these are warships, that they have some pretty awesome weapons and they are meant for fighting. And that's a weird contrast there at the beginning is they're out there in the universe exploring. Seemingly things are relatively peaceful. That is, it's not an active war zone every time they're traveling. And yet they're in a no kidding warship that's able to blow things out of space relatively easily, given the the right the right opponent. That's a that's a weird contrast. And what it led me to think when I was first watching Star Trek many, many years ago is I really don't understand the international order as it applies to space. So I guess what the interplanetary order is it? Is it unipolarity because the, the Federation is the dominant power and there are just these things adjacent that are kind of like the Romans picking off what they called barbarians around the borders? Or is it bipolarity because the Klingons are in fact a massive empire and they're just barely crossing over spheres of influence? Um, do we Are we led to believe that with the Romulans it's tripolar or is it multipolarity with others? How do you envision the if you will, the international system, the interplanetary system of the Federation and its opponents, especially in the original series? Yeah, it's it's a good question. And it, it, you do have to, the way you put that's very interesting. Do you, do you view it as you experienced it maybe on the first time you watched the show? Or do you kind of retcon it all given <laughs> given what you know uh, with, with all the material that's that's come out later? Um, I think the the truth of the the from the production side is I don't think they knew either, and we have to remember that these this was an era of television in which none of these plot lines had to be linked together because the point of a TV show was once it gets in syndication, any episode can be shown in any order, and so you really have to have something that neatly kind of disassembles itself at the end of every week. So no no real long term arc can be sustained. I mean that is a 
a much more recent phenomena, you know, dating from basically the era of kind of prestige television. Um, and, and that's maybe where Battlestar Galactica is so distinctive from Star Trek. In Battlestar Galactica, like you, you, you can't watch the episodes out of order. Um, I think in, in, so that I think is the production truth. I think in terms of using Star Trek as a way to think about international politics, I think the most useful way to think about it is as essentially a bipolar or a, you know, two and a half pole uh, system with the Federation and the Klingons, the, the Romulans as, as kind of a, a, a lesser but still um, significant power. And one of the most telling and incisive kind of e- episodes that dealt with this theme in Star Trek is the the episode where they, they meet the Organians, who are these kind of um, super powerful kind of godlike figures. What kind of happens is Kirk and, and, and crew kind of happen upon uh, a place that is being sort of subjected um, to domination by the Klingons. And of course, they're the Klingons, right? So they're they're undemocratic and they're repressive. And and we, the Federation, are going to go down there. And what, what do we do to uh, small, small places that are being uh, subjected to terrible Klingon domination? We, we liberate them and we, we welcome them into the, the world of democracy and freedom. And so kind of Kirk and Spock go down to the planet and they start saying to the, to the citizens, you know, shouldn't you be fighting the Klingons? Shouldn't you kind of raise up an army and get rid of this occupying force and we'll, we'll help you? And they, they say, no, we're not really that bothered. And the Klingons are objectively horrible to them. And like, we, we don't really care. They're very sort of zen <laughs> uh, about what's going on. Um, and it turns out that the whole thing is actually being orchestrated by these kind of supernatural or super powerful figures, the Organians, who say, what is really going on here, Kirk, Spock, is your federation is no different than the Klingons. And you model yourselves as kind of paragons of democracy and, and people who are bringing liberation uh, to this place. But you're actually just engaged in a kind of power politics game uh, with the Klingons um, because you're both basically superpowers. And this is very analogous to, I mentioned neorealism earlier, to the theory of international politics called neorealism, which was sort of a, a, a laid a wrinkle on traditional power politics that argued that everyone just behaves the way they do in international politics because of their structural position kind of vis-a-vis one another. And you are going to behave in a specific way if you're a superpower, regardless of whether you're a democracy or a dictatorship or communist or capitalist, or in this case, federation or Romulans. And so the Organians said, said, said to Kirk, you're the same as the Klingons and Klingons. And Kirk says, no, we're democratic. And the Organians say that makes no difference. You're, you're just kind of uh, acting out this kind of superpower role. And even more presciently, in in some period of time, you and the Klingons will be friends. I mean, this the, these roles are not forever. These structural power positions are not not forever. And that is, of course, what happened both in this fictional Star Trek world and in our in our real world. Well, at least for a bit. I don't know. Are we are the United States and Russia are, uh, <laughs> not really friends. There's been some backsliding there, but <laughs> that that's a very interesting episode because even as, and I have no idea what age I was when I saw it, but watching Star Trek in syndication because TV was very different, at least when I grew up than it is now. Um, Syndication was everything. And I remember shows that I'm, I'm assuming most of them were in syndication. Maybe some of them were actually still producing episodes, but you could find them all over the place on the, the various channels you could get at various times a day. And it was things like MASH and Star Trek were the big ones, but there were others. And I remember seeing this episode and even at that relatively young age thinking, this is not subtle, right? The Klingons are the Russians. The Klingons are the evil empire, Warsaw Pact, and they're brutal and they're oppressive and they don't allow freedom of choice and they're imposing their will. And the Federation is like so clearly America. And kind of a slap across the face in that episode when the, what turn out to be the, the Organians do say, yeah, you're basically just doing the same thing out there colonizing, you know, the galaxy. Um, that was rough. Star Wars, Star Trek was known for that. Star Trek, you know, did a lot of social commentary and political commentary with only the thinnest veneer of science fiction to it. I mean, the most, the most dramatic one that isn't as much international. And I think this is when I always forget the title of the episode, but something about let this be your last battlefield or let that be your last battlefield where they encounter the planet where some of the people are black on one half of their face and white on the other half and others vice versa. 
and they're in conflict. And of course, the Federation comes in and says, what's wrong with you? Why are you fighting over this? This is not a significant difference. It's like, well, you couldn't make it much more clear for audiences in the 1960s, could you? Yeah, exactly. And and I think that's true. And it, it, it was not subtle, which is really remarkable because we have to remember how sort of conservative American television culture was in those days. And this goes back to one of the, the benefits that speculative fiction has always had, which is the ability to sort of evade um, either explicit or implicit censorship um, in, in terms of saying difficult things for for those in power um, to hear. And I, I, I was stunned when I was researching the original production of Star Trek and, and this really indicates how conservative kind of television culture was at the time, to find out that one of the major dramas they had in even getting the first episode on screen had to do with Spock. And Spock had pointed ears. And the, the message came back from some of the networks, particularly in, in more conservative parts of America, well, that's a devil then. And we're not putting a devil on the television because, you know, <laughs> good Christians will find this offensive. And this, of course, was tied up not just with morality, but with kind of making money. The problem is if people find these things offensive, advertisers would pull their money out, out of the show um, and, and you, you, you kind of wouldn't have the money to sustain the thing. And it was a pretty close run call whether Spock could actually have his pointed ears because of this kind of devilish, uh, you know, suspected overtone to his character. And so set in, set in that context, to be able to have absolutely on the nose critiques of the behavior of superpowers in other episodes, um, the Vietnam War, race relations, as you as you mentioned, to be able to do that in the context of 60s network television culture was was really a remarkable achievement for science fiction. Of course, all of these things, we, we wouldn't think twice nowadays about a critique of American foreign policy thinly veiled being put on television. I mean, so I'm sure conservatives would argue that is the entirety of <laughs> American popular culture <laughs> nowadays, but it, but it really was a remarkable thing in that context. Mm -hmm. There's another episode that that you've written about as highlighting the contrast between the fundamental schools of thought on international relations and human nature in many ways, uh, realism and idealism. And that was the episode City on the Edge of Forever, uh, which is a remarkable episode, even for people who aren't into science fiction. It's a, a brilliant, relatively short examination of some very deep issues. Briefly describe the episode and then do that overlay onto realism and idealism and how it points out that that rough dilemma that policymakers actually have in executing what they believe to be an ethical foreign policy. Yeah, so City on the Edge of Forever, kind of the setup is the Enterprise finds this, I don't know what you would call it, uh, entity, a uh, portal called the, the, the Guardian of Forever. I mean, it's essentially just some, some rocks with some kind of multicolored special effects in the, in the center. A portal um, of some kind. Yes, exactly. That kind of time travels you to different points in space and time. And through a series of, uh, I, th I guess the phrase is a series of unfortunate events, the Enterprise crew finds themselves back in uh, kind of 1932, 1933 America, in Depression era America prior to the, to the Second World War. And one of the Enterprise crew members is kind of taken in by this good Samaritan called Edith Keeler. Um, and this crew member is kind of disoriented and, and needs help and um, you know, he's from the 23rd century, he's a bit surprised. <laughs> so he needs some kind of orientation and Edith Keeler uh, helps him and she's this kind of lovely woman and she's a, a pacifist and she believes the the best in people and she's, you know, what, what you'd call in international relations terms or maybe just philosophical terms, um, an idealist. Through this series of events, um, history is altered so that Edith Keeler, who in our real world, or I mean, this gets actually quite confusing. In our real world, as it's extrapolated to the to the twenty third century world of the of the Federation, um, Edith Keeler dies kind of shortly after encountering this Enterprise crew member. But during the the, the course of events in the episode, history has changed, so Edith Keeler survives, and she's such a kind of profoundly persuasive and good person that she rises in American society. Uh, through the you know the intervening years to the point where she has a um, very important role kind of advising Franklin Roosevelt um, and she sort of convinces Franklin Roosevelt that kind of war is not the answer that that a pacifist approach to the rising um, terrors that, that would culminate in the Second World War um, was was the right approach and in this kind of altered timeline 
Hitler and and the other uh, kind of repressive regimes are not successfully defeated, and so you never have the the good future of the USS Enterprise and the Federation. Um, what has to happen in the episode, it turns out, is Edith Keeler must die almost directly at the hands of Kirk, or at least by an act of non-intervention uh, by Kirk, who it so happens falls in love. I mean, this is James Kirk. He, he kind of falls in love with her in the, in the, in the five minutes that's, <laughs> that's kind of dedicated to that subplot in the, uh, oh, in, in, in the show. <laughs> yeah. um, with, his, with his winsome ways, um, he, he kind of wins her over. And he has to allow her to die in order for the the kind of desperately bad future that's been created by the alternate timeline to be averted and to really revert history to the good timeline where um, Kirk and Spock and McCoy, the Enterprise crew members, can go back to the Enterprise and and we have a history where Hitler was defeated and the and the Federation was was brought into being. And what this really dramatizes, I, I think, in international relations terms, is kind of the oldest battle in thinking in the in the in schools of thought about international politics between idealists and realists idealists who would say look if if you just act in um not necessarily uh, pacifistic but in non-militaristic diplomacy oriented ways if you just assume the best of people you'll get the best outcome and conversely if you're suspicious of people and you do things like build up your armies and uh, form secret alliances and and form international alliances um, if if you do these things, you will provoke the worst in people, and that's kind of the idealist viewpoint. And Edith Keel is kind of representing that in this this Star Trek episode. The realist viewpoint is that is in in all but very circumscribed uh, areas of life, a hopelessly naive way to think about life, politics, really anything. And what happens if you act in idealistic ways is that you simply get trampled by bullies and there's no one to stand up to bullies. And an an idealist approach to the Second World War would be an approach that did not uh, bring the United States into the war and would have led to an absolutely catastrophic outcome. So realists think idealists are good people and they have the right kind of goals, which are goals of peace and so forth, but they're just profoundly deluded about the means that are necessary to achieve good ends. And the most realist thing of all is doing dirty or or morally bad things in the service of good ends. And so when Kirk allows Edith Keeler to be killed in this episode, Kirk is acting as a realist. He's doing something that is locally immoral, allowing the death of you know a, a fantastic human being. But Kirk is doing it for the greater good, which is what realists always say when they're accused of being kind of dirty proponents of power politics. You know, we're not the dirty ones. We are the we are the sensible ones who, by our actions, ensure the best possible long term outcome, although we are still dealing with humans. And so the best possible long term outcome is not going to be an ideal long term outcome. It, it really is the manifestation of that phrase, the road to hell is paved with good intentions. You you can be trying to do the right thing. You can believe in what, in this case, you might even believe in what uh, Edith Keeler was saying and wanting that to be the world. But trying to make that happen actually enables Adolf Hitler to win and subject the world to a global dictatorship. And that, that ain't so good. Yeah, 100%, 100%. And it's I, I think that's a very effective episode, and it's it's fairly clear where the writers of that episode come down <laughs> on that dilemma that that they're realists. I think if I, if I was to critique kind of the book I wrote and the the way that I use science fiction in, in the book, I would say that that those are uses of science fiction that we would characterize as kind of problem solving uses of of theory or or of fiction in this case. You know, you're you're faced with a desperately evil dictator, and what is the right thing to do? And the the right answer is obviously to do what Kirk did, or it's to do what what realists did. There is another function science fiction has, which is to imagine completely radically different worlds that where, where there, there are just total revolutions in in the nature of relationships between between people. And I, I I don't want to spoil anything, but the you know as 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 three body goes on, it maybe it maybe starts in that kind of problem solving mode, and maybe then goes to you know to to more distant or more radical places. And I I think if I was to to critique the book I wrote, I would say I did a lot of using types of science fiction 
to solve problems that are very similar to the problems that we have in our world. And I maybe didn't quite fully embrace the radical revolutionary possibilities that are, that are offered by some forms of science fiction. But maybe that's maybe I just need Otherworldly Politics the sequel. You know, if anyone's any publishers are listening and want to want to commission this, then uh, then this is maybe the chance. You've done the right thing by, you know, leaving yourself some some more things to write about. So this is a good thing, right? Yes. <laughs> the other aspect that um, Star Trek has done well, um, largely through not not exclusively, but largely through the character of Spock himself, is illustrating a lot of the promise and the the risks of a fully rational choice theory approach to politics. So give give the pretend I'm the undergrad in your intro course. Give the two sentence introduction to rational choice theory, and then how everything from some of the original episodes like uh, Mirror Mirror and the movies, uh, including Wrath of Khan and others, play out some of these some of these explorations of humans and Vulcans as rational actors and how that applies to politics. Yeah, well, now you, now you've mentioned Wrath of Khan. You know, I'll be in tears in five minutes because this 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 a movie that ever since I saw it as a as a kid ha, just has a, a, a actually a physical effect on me, and I <laughs> I, I find it so it's so emotionally taxing. And I realize there's kind of ninety eight percent of the audience are kind of guffawing at this point, but there's there's probably the two percent that's like, dude, I know I cry too every time. <laughs> I gotta say, it it hits me on both sides of that the same way that you and uh, Jeff on the the popcast talked about, which is number one. I still remember vividly, and it strikes me every time I see it, even as a largely grown adult, when I saw it as a kid. And the scene with Chekhov and on the the planet at the beginning with the um, oh the bug the, the, the thing that goes parasite, in his ear absolutely his terrifying ear, which scarred me for a long time with anything within you know miles of my ears so there's the emotional reaction that still hits me there but then the 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 build up the conclusion the the you know Spock at the end still gets me I'm not gonna lie that that still gets to me too and. I have to give credit to a lot of the choices made by uh, the director, Nicholas Meyer, a previous guest of ours here on Chatter, even though my co-host Shane spoke with him much more about the day after and the cultural importance of that made-for-TV movie uh, in the 1980s. But Nicholas Meyer directed Star Trek II, The Wrath of Khan, and if I re recall, also Star Trek IV, The Voyage Home, and Star Trek VI. So he, he kind of almost yes he kind of co-wrote um uh, he he co-wrote four Nimoy directed yeah. four um oh. and he, and he did write six which which incidentally okay. like two and six are the most are the I am going to answer your rational choice question by the way I haven't forgotten yeah. two and six we'll are the there. most um yeah the the most kind of politically astute um of the movies and you know Meyer I think uh, you know I I'd said that part of the Star Trek universe or a lot of it is Roddenberry's original vision and part of it is the people that were brought in to write or to take in a different direction along the way. And Meyer, I would say, is, is the most important person who came into the Star Trek universe aside from Roddenberry. And Meyer just had a, a, a completely different view of what Star Trek was to the point that Roddenberry was horrified um, by, by what Meyer was doing and said, why, why are you turning the Enterprise into this un unambiguous warship where people are giving orders and why is this so brutal and why are people dying and this isn't my vision at all and Maya would say yeah but your vision has kind of run its course <laughs> dramatically better movies that way and it's not just you and me saying that the general consensus among star trek fans and critics is that the movies like two four and six if not the three best across all star trek movies are definitely three of the top four or five yeah and i mean the the key to to, to Maya, maybe, maybe he said this to you. I, I, I don't know. But the the key to Maya, as I understand it, is one: he didn't like Star Trek. He, he thought it was ridiculous. Um, two: what he really wanted to do was make a movie of Moby Dick when he got control of kind of Wrath of Khan. Um, and and no, but no one would would kind of finance that. Um, and and you know that's really uh, how Maya kind of gets into uh, gets into Star Trek and is so successful. Um, Anyway, that that was a diversion, uh, an, an irrational diversion, we might it say. Was, from but, your... a, but a good one. But yes, rational choice theory. What is it, and how does Star Trek play it out there? Yeah, rational choice theory. So, rational choice theory is um, a model of human decision making that 
you know, we can contrast to the two we've been talking about. Idealism, people are good. Realism, people are essentially kind of power oriented or, or, or selfish, bad in some ways, if you want to be kind of simplistic about it. Rational choice theory says people are neither. People are just kind of self-interested. And the, the best and way to think about what a person is, is a person is just a calculator. And they, they will behave in a way that makes the sums add up for them to get the thing that they want. And this made rational choice theory um, extremely popular and portable across many areas of life and certainly the academy, um, including psychology, uh, economics, and, and political science and international relations, because the thing that people were said to want and were said to kind of rationally make choices towards could change depending upon what puzzle you were trying to explain. So in economics, the thing that people want is to kind of maximize the, the, the value of the, the way they're using their money. Or maybe if you're a firm, you want to maximize your profit or your market share. Um, you know, in, in international politics, the thing that you're often said to be trying to maximize is power or security. You know, there are, there are different variants, but it could also be kind of the health of your economy comparatively. So that's rational choice theory. People are calculators. They, uh, there's essentially no difference between people. They all, they all, given the same situation, will make um, the same decision, uh, which is to maximize their interests, which made it... Even if sorry, they're not, ahead. it's a useful theory to predict their behavior to assume that they are, right? So it's not just like the, the caricature of neorealism is that, you know, Kenneth Waltz said that all states are black boxes. No, he clearly did not say all states are truly black boxes, that their internal systems are the same. He said, for the purpose of predictive theory, if you assume certain things about the system, you can get a whole lot of purchase on international relations. Rational choice the same way. It's it's not stating that everybody maximizes utility at all times, but it's a useful theory for predicting behavior. Yes, I, I, I agree with you. There is, I think, a split amongst political scientists between some who, who take theory as being kind of literal descriptions of the way things are, and some who take them as kind of useful ways to think about things. I, I sort of agree with the way you presented Waltz there. And th that was one reason why I find science fiction to be such a useful guide to international relations that I'm not, I'm not sure I mentioned in the past, which is what science fiction does is it doesn't say the world literally is this. We don't literally have spaceships. It says, imagine a world in which these things existed that was set up in this way. What can you now deduce about the world of your experience? And I would say international relations theory at its best is doing the same thing. Like Walt said, imagine a world of essentially rational actors who will will behave in broadly the same way, um, depending upon uh, the situation that they uh, that they face. Or differences in behavior will be determined by differences not in their internal composition, but in the situations that they face. I'm not saying that's literally true. I'm saying what can we now say that's useful about the world. Um, and you could say a lot of useful things from from neorealism. So how did this play out in in Star Trek? You mentioned a, a couple of, you know, an episode and a, and a movie. And I think let's let's talk briefly about both. So Mera Mera, um, the uh, episode of the original series, is a very classic demonstration of idealism, realism, and rational choice theory. So in Mera Mera, um, there is, again, a series of unfortunate events. <laughs> I'm sure it was described somewhat differently on the, uh, in, the, in the production notes, but, but let's call it that, um, that leads to an um, accident in the transporter system, which would kind of teleport people from, from one place to another, from the ship to the planet. And uh, weird stuff happens, you know, screen goes funny and Kirk and um, the landing party kind of step off the transporter and the Enterprise is all different and people are wearing kind of funky uniforms and they give these kind of sort of Nazi-esque um, salutes. Um, and, you know, simultaneously, a different Kirk, uh, a much kind of meaner Kirk um, and, and other members of his, his landing party um, step out of the transporter pod and they're on the Enterprise we know. And what's happened is a kind of, uh, I guess, what you now call a multiverse <laughs> uh, has occurred. And uh, Good Kirk has gone to the mirror universe where the Federation is uh, bad, is, is essentially built on kind of brutalist principles, not the sort of idealist uh, principles that, that we were used to seeing. And people sort of advance uh, up the chain of command by killing their superiors and the Federation is not a kind of benevolent, diplomacy-oriented organization, but it's essentially a, a sort of rapacious, explicitly imperialist 
um, organization. And Good Kirk's task in the bad universe is to, uh, you know, first of all, try and get back to the good universe. And second of all, um, try and sort of effect some change <laughs> within this bad universe and, and get them back on what he would regard as a much more rational track. Incidentally, in, in, in the good universe, bad Kirk is sort of instantly discovered because he's just behaving as this kind of barbarian. And amongst these super enlightened people, this stands out like a million miles and he gets put in the brig and that's that. But good Kirk in the bad universe is sort of smart enough that he sort of plays along with the, uh, the, the brutality and he can kind of pull the wool over people's eyes. And so, you know, things ensue. And in the end, Kirk is able to kind of hatch a plan where he can kind of swap over with his counterpart and everything will be will be returned to normal. Um, the interesting point that's made, and I think this is where rational choice theory comes in, is in both of these universes, you know, Spock is not part of this landing party. And so there's no switch off Spock's. Bad Spock is still on the bad Enterprise. Good Spock is still on the good Enterprise. I mean, the, the big difference is bad Spock has a goatee beard. Um, which I, I guess denotes the ability to survive in uh, in harsh circumstances. And I don't that know is how the that cultural works. meme that exists from this episode for people even outside Star Trek is the evil Spock with the goatee. But he's, but he's not really evil as such. He's definitely part of that environment and he operates within that environment and he survived in it. But but he's kind of stayed the same you know, logical person. Because that's what rational choice says, right? It says that people don't actually differ in their fundamental goodness or fundamental badness, which is which is kind of the premise of the of the multiverse, a bad federation full of bad people, federation full of good people. Spock is rational in both universes. And so as you say, he accommodates himself. I mean, he's not an idiot. He, you know, acts in reasonable ways. But it also means that he is the person to whom good Kirk can appeal not to make change within the bad federation because it's the right thing to do, which is what an idealist would do. But Kirk appeals to Spock's rationalism. He recognizes that this is the tenor in which change is possible. And he says, look, Spock, you know, I'm not, I'm not going to talk about morality here, but it is irrational to have this kind of rapacious imperialism. W wouldn't the federation get along better if it actually tried to make some friends and set up some kind of peaceable <laughs> diplomatic and trading relations? He says, look, Spock, it's kind of ridiculous that the way that you um, get promoted is by killing off your superior. I mean, that's, you know, that just sort of creates some inefficiencies around the office. <laughs> and we, would it not be better if you, <laughs> you know, set up like an HR program and did some trainings and, and we're, we're all kind of more reasonable and rational to one another? And Spock says, you know, I, I kind of see the logic there and and I'll consider it. And you, you the episode does leave you with the impression that it will be rationalism that rescues the bad federation from its badness not an appeal to, to morality because ultimately like being bad is I irrational um, in that telling. Now, uh, Wrath of Khan. Yes. Greatest on-screen um, representation of both the kind of strengths and the, the sort of hard limits of rationalism or utilitarianism. And this is something Maya would do to Roddenberry's ideas again and again, which is he'd point out the the wrinkles or the limit or the, the, the kind of other way of thinking about uh, this kind of thing. Um, so in Wrath of Khan, a uh, series of unfortunate events, <laughs> uh, turns out that uh, the Enterprise is kind of trapped close to um, another uh, starship, the starship of the antagonist, and the starship's going to self-destruct and the Enterprise is like badly damaged and it can't get away in time. Um, it's actually a fascinating moment in the life of James T. Kirk because he is faced with, he's going to die. Like, he's lost. And this is, the, this is the person who never loses, who never, as, as he says in the movie, who ne never faces death, who always cheats his way out of death. And I, I, again, this is what, another one of the things about that really remarkable movie that always stayed with me was they put that kind of uh, indomitable character in the most vulnerable position, which is he, he had unambiguously lost. He was dead, and even worse, he had led everyone that he was supposed to be in charge of to their death as well through his inadequacies. Um, fortunately, though, he has this buddy, <laughs> Mr. Spock. And Spock takes the decision that there are lots of people on the, on the Enterprise, and I am one person. And it is rational for me to sacrifice myself by exposing myself to this kind of deadly dose of of radiation down in the, the engineering room um, 
in order that I can that I can save the ship. And this, of course, is what happens. And Spock is the great hero, but he but he pays the ultimate price. I mean, he does die um, in the act of saving the ship. And in his sort of death throes, he explains to Kirk that what he had done was actually rational, and it was the only logical thing to do. You know, the needs of the uh, the needs of the many outweigh the needs of the few, or the one. Um, and and that is that is absolutely rational. And in that sense, this is just a, a kind of fairly unreformed kind of Jeremy Bentham utilitarian calculation. But of course, if you watch the movie and you've seen the way it's played, that is not at all what is going on. You know, what is going on is Spock is hiding behind utilitarianism to explain, you know, the, the love he has for his friends and his shipmates. And it's actually, a, a, you know, for this man who had been regarded as a as a calculator, you know, I almost said a human calculator because he's, he's famously not human, who, who had been portrayed as this kind of walking, unemotional calculator. It is him showing at, at, at the last that what we always knew, he is anything but that. And although the the, the kind of sacrifice is explained in utilitarian terms, um, my reading anyway is that it, it has relatively little at that point to do with utilitarian. It's it's sort of an act of love and an act of friendship, an act of, an act of comradeship. Absolutely. So we talked a little bit about uh, Gene Roddenberry and his more, I guess, idealistic, uh, progressive vision for what the future would be like. Even though in episodes that he himself at some level approved, there were some very blunt realist statements like the city on the edge of forever, uh, which was not about this inherent idealism. Everything's going to work out well. It was about tough choices. Things felt a little bit different for me in a series that I never got into as much as the original series, which is the next generation. Um, It felt like there was a different vision that was like all literature and in culture reflective of its times. Talk about how the next generation envisioned the, what you will, international relations or interplanetary relations and, and what that reflected about the time in which it was made. Yeah, so so it's, Star Trek goes off the off the screens, uh, you know, after after three seasons, and there are these um, attempts to to bring it back, and eventually one of these attempts is successful um, in the the late nineteen eighties. I think Next Generation starts in nineteen eighty seven, and the Star Trek that comes back, the Next Generation, um, portrays a Federation a hundred years after the the events of the original series, and Ronbury's influence is is at least at, at, at this point quite clear because this is a bigger, um, you know, more expansive, more powerful, and, and even more evolved federation than we'd seen in the original series. And that was kind of true to Roddenberry's logic that humans were on this kind of teleological upward trajectory. And we, we might not be particularly good people um, in the, the 40s when Roddenberry fought in the Second World War or the 60s when he made the original series, but by the 24th century, not even the 23rd century, um, we, we would have evolved to be much better. Um, and so that's kind of the, the setup for the next generation. The other things that are going on is the Cold War is kind of coming to an end. And that's reflected in uh, the next generation in which the Klingons and the, the Federation are uh, allies at this point. You know, there's a Klingon officer who serves on the bridge of the, the Enterprise, kind of fulfilling the Organian's prophecy that you will become friends. Of course, reflecting, you know, movie, uh, the events of a movie that we we spoke about glancingly, uh, Star Trek VI, The Undiscovered Country, where the Remind Klingon me, Empire... Remind do I, do I remember right that in the, the early episodes of The Next Generation, there is no big bad, right? There is no Klingon Empire that's the, the other pole. Yes, there's, uh, you know, Q and other amazing beings that have powers, but there's not like the existential struggle that eventually became part of the original series with the Klingon Empire. Yeah, 100%. And and this again was, you know, Roddenberry um, uh, died, actually, you know, uh, fairly early in the the, the run of uh, Next Generation, but he did have a strong influence on the first season and kind of consistent with his views. Um, you're right, there, there was no big bad. There was no kind of primary um, antagonist. This seemed to be a, a kind of galaxy that was almost wholly dominated by by the Federation. And I, I liken it in the book to ideas that were circulating at the time in, in international politics um, to do with kind of globalization, uh, you know, the increasing interconnection of, of the world, which, which at that point was seen to be 
likely to be a technology driven elimination of difference you know that that would lead to to everyone be, being the same you had people like uh, Thomas Friedman writing articles about you know I've been to McDonald's uh, branches all over flat. the world yeah, yeah the, the world is flat uh, I've been to uh, McDonald's all over the world and and everywhere seems the same to me and no countries that that have McDonald's have ever fought wars we want another you know ipso dipso the world is is all the same and you know uh, no wars will ever be fought I mean it could just be he was uh, maybe not exploring these various parts of the world with quite the diligence <laughs> that, 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 that you might hope. Uh, Francis Fukuyama is at this point working on what would become his, you know, uber famous end of history article and then book, arguing that, you know, ideological contestation had essentially ended in the late 1980s and the future would be um, increasing homogenization. Uh, you know, in, in terms of political forms, but also just basically ideologies. And that's what season one of Next Generation was like. It seemed to be a dramatization, essentially, of um, those ideas. It it was also fantastically boring. I mean, largely for those <laughs> for those reasons, you know, that there, there, were, there were no real antagonists. And, you know, the, the writers would recount that, that they felt they'd been put in what they called the Roddenberry box, and the Roddenberry box is this kind of uh, stricture or, the, you know, well, structure and stricture <laughs> that says you can't have any conflict because everyone's so evolved now and there are no big antagonists. Um, and, you know, people don't really vie for, you know, o- over money and ambition and petty power struggles. And, and the writers would say, you know, this is like, this sounds like a lovely place to live, but how am I supposed to write whatever it was, 26 <laughs> one hour TV episodes? Yeah, what's what's the arc here? Like someone's nice to someone else and then they all shake hands. I mean, that's kind of, kind of boring TV. This was boredom that, I mean, not to stretch this analogy too far, but boredom was something that Francis Fukuyama identified as being the major problem at the end of history. That, right. that history without ideological contestation is is dull and people will just lapse into sort of vapid, mindless consumerism. Um, and Next Generation, I think, almost got, got cancelled. I mean, there was the famous attempt to introduce a new villain, which were called the Ferengi, which Mm -hmm. are kind of these uh, three foot tall, um, you know, humanoid figures. They're kind of giant ears. Uh, They they sort of had these whips that they kind of, you know, uh, uh, spun around above their heads, which did seem a bit sort of underwhelming when everyone else has ray guns. Um, And, you know, they they, they just weren't a a sort of threatening um, enemy. And so there had to actually be a, a fairly radical reset on Next Generation. Um, in order to rescue that show and interject some drama, in in rather the same way, although the, maybe this is a you know this is a, a a facile point to make, but the it, it did become apparent as the 1990s went on that Friedman-esque you know tension-free globalization or Fukuyama-esque end of history was was not our immediate future either and we were i'm afraid in for a, a a bumpier ride than than maybe those two had had envisaged well i tell you the the next generation did eventually get around to one of the the better villains i think in tv science fiction uh the borg which is the the ultimate collective right the ultimate hive mind so they did get there but it was almost as if I don't know if it was a conscious reaction to this feeling about the the early episodes and the early lack of that kind of direct conflict driving things or what it was. Um, but that did get to an issue even more so than I think some of the original series episodes did about the fundamental tension between political order of representation and freedom of choice, which we presume the the, the, the Federation of Planets is a fully functioning democratic institution of some kind um, versus the the ultimate collective where there is no true individual identity and everybody is is centrally controlled for the collective good. Um, they made that just as stark as some of those original series episodes were in terms of the conflict between the two. Yeah, exactly. And the, I agree with you, the Borg are one of the great enemies, certainly the great enemy of, of Next Generation and sort of saved that, that series from... Um, from absolute uh, I- irrelevance, certainly from cancellation. And the really important thing about them was that they were so powerful. And, you know, the the, the Federation had been presented much in the same way as people thought about the United States during the, the kind of unipolar moment at the end of the Cold War as having no enemies and just effortlessly swatting 
uh, everyone aside. And, and, you know, Kenneth Waltz would have told you, could have told you that that situation is inherently unstable and it, it will never last. And it, it didn't last in fiction either. And the, the bog come along and they are, as you say, kind of this terrifying hive mind, this, this sort of uh, collectivizing force. And they also function as this really kind of um, uh, Rorschach test <laughs> kind of entity in the people, people try and decode the, bo- the bog as representing very different things in our, in our world, depending upon what their ideologies are. So for some people, you know, the bog, are, well, it's clear they're communists, right? They're trying to like get rid of individual freedom and crush us all and make us conform. Um, and that's one reading of the bog. For other people, the bog is clearly sort of uh, capitalism and neoliberalism, and it's trying to homogenize everything and crush kind of individual difference. And so dif- different people would, would draw analogies between the bog and, uh, and, uh, and kind of our real world. Um, but they, they definitely helped that show because my goodness, it was it was going nowhere at first. <laughs> well, I won't get into all of the other series that have been on since then, uh, mostly because I have not seen most of the other series. But it's fair to say that some of the creators and, and writers and probably some of the individual directors and actors and things understood a lot of these issues and learned from the experiences of others because there's been a lot more diversity of uh, some of these themes in later Star Trek uh, series, but I'll, I'll leave that for another day. But I do want to touch again on something we touched on earlier, which is Battlestar Galactica, the the newer version, because it's some of the best television I've ever seen, um, especially a, a few episodes really stand out to me. One you referred to earlier because of the the suicide bombing and the the fact of how it played out in that environment after 9-11 and the so-called global war on terror with the episode. It was about occupation. And I have this memory that it was called occupation or something like that, but a brilliant episode that got to some of these fundamental things, but they didn't do it in a facile way. Uh, and then the other one that I'd like you to speak about um, also is the episode 33, which is one of the most intense episodes of television I've ever watched. And I think my blood pressure is up just reflecting on watching that episode. Um, The opposite of the original series of Star Trek, where there was not this existential conflict, it was, oh, let's go explore this planet. And we find this strange new flower that makes us dance. And we need to figure out how to get away from that or who's Captain Kirk going to hit on this week. And instead, Battlestar Galactica it is about every episode is about existential survival, the survival of the human race itself on the line every week. And 33 made that explicit. Um, talk through those episodes in particular, but what what they collectively say about Battlestar Galactica and how it represents a way of looking at our own politics. Yeah. And the, I mean, you, you sort of alluded to that, that there is a link between kind of the later Star Treks and Battlestar Galactica. And that's Ronald D. Moore, who is the, the creator of Battlestar Galactica, who got his start as a staff writer on um, Next Generation, and then kind of took bigger roles in, uh, you know, Deep States Nine and Star Trek Voyager, which were were later series that that became sort of uh, more and more uh, serialized, you know, told longer stories and dealt with darker and darker themes, and and those were elements of storytelling that that Moore took to um, their zenith, I think, in Battlestar Galactica. The story of Battlestar Galactica, as as I understand it, it's it's kind of inception or or its reboot is. NBC was looking for a you know a franchise to reboot, and they said we got this Battlestar Galactica thing, and Ronald D. E. Moore was a, was approached, and he said, "Well, I'll go and watch the old uh, shows, and the old shows were sort of Star Wars ripoffs, at least aesthetically, and they, they were they were there was definitely an attempt to cash in on the popularity of Star Wars with Battlestar Galactica, but I'd always liked the old Battlestar Galactica, and I think not not only because it was kind of shooty shooty spaceships and so forth. But because it actually had quite a dark premise, it it was just in the 70s, you know, the original version, they hadn't quite paid off on the dark premise. And the very dark premise was the story begins with an apocalypse with, you know, with the wiping out of all but a, you know, a few tens of thousands of humans, you know, the the colonials, the stand in for stand ins for humans. And Ronald D. Moore said he went and, and, you know, asked by NBC to look at this franchise. Could it be revived? And he went and watched it in the aftermath of 9-11. And he said that this kind of darkness really hits differently now in this world where America is feeling kind of newly vulnerable, where where there's great suspicion about things like um, infiltration into societies, where 
the thoughts of apocalypse are just much more on people's minds. And what if we did that premise in in a in a very it took it very seriously in a very sort of serious way, and we said, what would society actually be like? in the aftermath of an apocalypse, when there's just sort of 50,000 people left, when you are being kind of constantly hunted. And it wouldn't be like Star Trek. You know, you wouldn't all be kind of patting yourself on your back, on, on, on your backs about being moral and, and nice and all the rest of it. It would be a, a fairly sort of brutal fight for survival. And, and Moore took, took note of or made use of uh, trends in television towards uh you know darker themes more uh you know longer storytelling arc uh kind of you know more prestige television um sensibilities and that's where Battlestar Galactica uh came from it's kind of brought back on the on the screens in like 2003 and then runs from sort of 2004 to 2009 so so the time period is post 9-11 right through uh you know the the meat of the Iraq war and, and all of these things are, are really, really prominent on screen. Um, the first episode that you that you mentioned, um, Occupation, uh, I mean, this, this was actually a sort of four or five uh, part story arc um, where uh, the, the humans discover um, a planet where they think they might have safe refuge and they may be able to settle. You know, by this point, it's sort of three seasons into the show and they've just been on the run constantly from, you know, second one uh, of the, you know, uh, of the show starting. Uh, they've lost lots of people. It's, you know, they're all living on spaceships. It's cramped. It's dank. Uh, they're trying to keep elements of civilization together, There's tr- but but they're really struggling. There's tremendous resource shortages and people just want somewhere to live. <laughs> and so they find this planet and it's not a paradise by any means, but it's sort of livable. Um, and they also believe due to kind of where it's located and the, you know, the the kind of atmospheric conditions in space around it, that it's pretty hidden, that they're probably not going to be discovered by the enemy that's pursuing them. And so they decide to settle on this planet um, against the strong advice of the military leader, Adama, um, but on the orders of uh, newly elected president um, uh, Gaius Balta, which, which is a name that, that everyone knows from the original series, and you kind of knew which way his character was w- was going to go. And so the the, the humans kind of settle on this uh, on this planet, and it turns out that it is not as hidden as they had hoped it was, and they're discovered relatively rapidly, and they don't now have the ability to 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 disappear, to jump away in the in the argot of the show, because they're they're all, you know the ships are in orbit, the battle stars and everyone else is on the surface. So the, the warships have to leave behind the civilian population, which is essentially the the 98% of the, the remnants of humanity, um, to be occupied by the Cylon enemy. And the Cylon enemy is a, you know, a totalitarian and, and repressive structure. I mean, in some senses, actually, I'm saying that, that they're a little more terrifying than that because they combine sort of totalitarianism with strains of, you know, uh, somewhat alien ideas about social engineering and, and how humans really, really should live and what would be <laughs> what would be good ways for their society to organize. And they leave Balter in place as a, a kind of quizzling you know, this is kind of a vichy, I mean, to mix uh, <laughs> mix historical episodes here, uh, kind of quizzling figure. And it, it's sort of this horrible um, circumstance. And the humans on this planet, in desperation, resort to suicide bombing. Um, you know, there's a, there's a senior military officer is left behind on the planet and he organizes a resistance. And part of this resistance is suicide bombing. And this causes tremendous sort of moral qualms amongst the, the human population. Um it basically destroys the, the this military officer Saul Tai. It sort of breaks his spirit. He he loses his wife in the the, the course of um, events when she's revealed as a collaborator, and he essentially kills her. Which again is this sort of dramatization of of like wartime necessities um, and an extremely morally you know difficult situations. Um, and it, and it is as you say, um, just a profoundly um, affecting dramatization of a sort of unimaginable um situation really just a remarkable uh, se- series of of television episodes um the geeky thing i'm going to say to you because i know you've seen it is that the most amazing thing i've ever seen on television is in you know a couple episodes on when they try and ra- mount the rescue mission and they do do you remember what i'm talking about they jump the galactica into the atmosphere 
and it kind of fall. It's not meant to be in an atmosphere, <laughs> so it just falls like a like a rocket. And I got up off my couch and I was like screaming, "What is happening? Do you think do you think this thing's going to crash?" Absolutely incredible. Anyway, um, th- thirty three. Very quickly, you also mentioned thirty three is the another episode, the first episode actually of. Once the, once the show had been commissioned after its you know new pilot, the first episode of the regular run of the series, and thirty three r- refers to the number of minutes, uh, you know, separating uh, the the reappearance of the Cylon enemy. So so basically, what's happening in this in this episode is the fleet that has escaped the original apocalypse is jumping away using its faster than light drives, um, and after 33 minutes, the Cylons are reappearing and start attacking them again and they have to immediately jump away, which is this huge puzzle because theoretically you're not supposed to be able to do that. Once you do this faster than light, it's supposed to be untraceable. So what is going on is a major problem. But also we join this series of events after about four days of this and the people are exhausted, you know, and and so every 33 minutes they're having to perform this series of really complex kind of combat maneuvers and no one can sleep. Certainly, no one on the on the Galactica, the the main kind of warship. And so they are all falling asleep, and they make mistakes. And one of the mistakes they make um, is that they, you know, uh, start to be sloppy in logging in which of the ships has successfully made the jump to the new rendezvous rendezvous co- coordinates after thirty three minutes. And it turns out they've lost a ship, the Olympic carrier that has been left behind, and they don't really know why it's been left behind. And, and while all this is going on, the, the kind of pilots that fly the fighter planes are having to kind of take drugs uh, to, to sort of stay awake. And the, there is an interesting production note. One of the actors, uh, Jamie Bamber, would, would always tell the story that Edward James Almas, who played Commander Adama, said during the, the production of 33 that, listen, guys, what we're going to do here is we're going to go method. And so we're not going to sleep. And he said, so, you know, to make it really like pop on screen, you've got to actually genuinely be tired. And so we're, none of us are going to sleep, guys. And we're, we're going to go crazy and it's going to get kind of trippy. And <laughs> he says in the end, they kind of talk at Edward James almost off, off the ledge there. But that was almost his original kind of <laughs> plan was we, we all literally will stay up for four days um, to yeah, shoot It's this. funny you say that because I, I had not heard that story. But my reflections of the episode are that, OK, that it, that must be what they've done because Somehow, whether they each individually did that to some degree, it definitely gave the impression of not just the the human body wearing down, but the human spirit, just this crushing fatigue that was permeating the entire episode. Um, just really, really amazing representation on film. Yeah. And and when I one of the things I do in the book is I kind of liken this to some crisis situations um, in the real world, and particularly some accounts that decision makers gave of things like um, the Cuban Missile Crisis, in which people like Robert McNamara reflected, you know, later in his life on what that experience was like. And he was like, just, he, he would say, look, we were terrified and we were exhausted. And, you know, he would be kind of presented by political scientists and others with this sort of game theory or rational choice model of what was going on. And they'd say, you know, but McNamara essentially like, this was a game of chicken, wasn't it? And you won and aren't you smart? And this is rational. And he would say like, it it wasn't a game and there were no chickens. Like we we literally thought we were the the world could end. And that the pressure was just unbelievable. And you could see it in Kennedy's face and everyone's face. And another kind of anecdote I have in the book is a Soviet submarine commander who was being sort of depth charged by um, uh, American destroyers trying to get him to surface. And the American destroyers were using, you know, depth charges of of kind of very uh, small capacity. They were just intended essentially as warnings, like you you must surface. But he didn't know that. He thought they were trying to sink him. He sort of lost his mind, according to his crew, and uh, wanted to start launching attacks on the ships above and would have massively escalated the situation, again, largely because of crisis dynamics. Uh, and in 33, anyway, the, the denouement is the Olympic carrier turns up again, this seemingly lost ship. And right after the Olympic carrier turns up, the Cylons are, uh, you know, are, are, are right behind them. And the Olympic carrier kind of flies straight towards the ship and is kind of, you know, giving off signals that it has sort of nuclear weapons on board. And it's supposed to be this kind of civilian airliner. And pilots have to take the decision uh, to, to shoot it down. And they don't really know what's happened to the people on this essentially civilian airliner. You know, there's supposed to be 300 people on there. Are they still on there? Have they been captured by the Cylons? What's going on? And they have to 
you know, shoot down a civilian airliner, which again, in the immediate aftermath of post 9-11 was, was not an unfamiliar um, uh, story. Yeah, what, what I think the show did well, almost universally, um, with only a few speed bumps, was the thing that I think any, any good fiction does well, which is highlight ethical dilemmas and, and, and make you feel them. Um, some do that better than others. Battlestar Galactica did it extremely well. And some might say that the original Star Trek, uh, although clunky at times, also did that on some fundamental issues at a time when, I can't remember when MASH started, but you know, MASH ended up doing that for some issues related to the Vietnam War and other things. But but Star Trek you know, was, was really doing that in some important ways on issues ranging from race relations to Viet from the beginning. So I guess they do share that DNA as well as ultimately the DNA of Ronald Moore. Yeah, I, th- I think so. And I think they are shows that it's, it's good to kind of watch them together, to watch <laughs> to watch kind of one after another. Um, you know, very, very effective. And, just, you know, we've, we've been talking about all their, their kind of intellectual virtues and so forth, but they're, they're just damn good television as well, right? <laughs> well, I do want to talk just briefly before we close on um, something we'll give short shrift to, but something I have always been curious about. And I'm not talking about the retconned user guides and these books that you can find hundreds of now in bookstores that are describing the universe, but the Star Wars universe. As a political scientist and as someone interested in international relations, the Star Wars universe just made me scratch my head because in the original movies, episode four, five, six, you learn that there kind of is and then quickly was the Galactic Senate, but it's not clear what they did and in what powers they had. And then you have the evil emperor. You have somebody who's pulling all the strings galactically, plots within plots, but definitely the big bad. And they just kind of leave out kind of how you got there. There's a few lines thrown out there about how things used to be better. And you get the sense that these characters are fighting for some vague sense of freedom, but but it's not clear you know, what political order they think is worth fighting and dying for, or whether they know something about the emperor that we don't know. It's, it's just a classic fight of good versus bad. Now, with the prequels, we get a little bit more of the story, but even then, it's just a huge legislative chamber with a lot of bureaucrats and lawyers and assistants who get in the way of efficient policymaking, but you don't really get a sense of what brought all of these different species, probably thousands in that chamber, what brought them together what is it a majority vote? Is it a super majority? Is are, are there regional governments that do various things? I felt very confused by the different representations of interplanetary governance in Star Wars. And you've probably thought about it a whole lot more than I have. And and I want you to help me feel better about the Star Wars universe. <laughs> I, th- I think I can help you feel better about being confused because I, I think it <laughs> I think it is very very confusing again with the with the limits that you put on it you know if you if you if you say look all we know is what is put on screen in the original trilogy how does this work it's amazingly confusing i mean what you know what does vader do apart from, i mean you know there's clearly a couple of lines of authority in the empire one of which is sort of political military bureaucratic administrative but the other of which is sort of religio mystical culty and where does Vader fit in that? I mean, he's clearly number two in the in the kind of culty stuff, but at, but at times he's given orders by the military personnel, and at other times he's he seems to just order them around. He has no problem killing them, so clearly he's not subject to <laughs> to military discipline. So so I think it's definitely kind of a a confusing universe. I suppose in that does have some beneficial effects, at least in at least in dramatic terms, which is you're left to fill in a lot of that by your imagination. And this was, I think, Lucas's great genius, which is he just put a few things and illusions on screen and you had to fill in the rest by yourself. And your imagination is always a more compelling storyteller than than someone else being forced to like actually write write things down. And of course, rather famously, Star Trek, Star Wars, sorry, begins with episode four. Right. So so you are led into you you are led to believe that you are picking up a story halfway through, which gives it this kind of great propulsive quality but it does mean that that you do think well what happened in the first three that that determined this kind of system of government and where where are the, where do the x-wings come from? and who's building them and 
there's an academy, but the, does the Rebel Alliance have their own academy? And aren't they being hunted? So could, wouldn't they just like bomb this academy? And you know, it's it's it, it is a a sort of very confusing uh, set of structures. I often go through this this exercise with my class where we we explore this, and I try to give them kind of a few different readings as to what the politics of this universe might be. And I start by saying that Lucas was very interested in the analogy between the United States and, sorry, the, the analogy between the United States and the empire during the period of Vietnam. And of course, he, he was thinking about Star Wars kind of towards the tail end of the, of the Vietnam War. And he made comments at the time saying things like the United States will be the empire in 10 years time. And he was sort of taken by a, <laughs> an analogy between Nixon and the, uh, and, uh, and the emperor and so forth. And so the, the sort of that reading, there are also readings of Star Wars from a more conservative side that, that the Empire is really what they're trying to do is sort of provide some order <laughs> and some law. And, and if you sort of flip it in that way, I know we're supposed to see the, the Rebel Alliance as the good guys and the Empire as the, as the bad guys. But if you do the thought experiment of flipping it, I mean, the Rebel Alliance does, does a lot of things that look a bit kind of terroristy. And, you know, the the Jedi do seem like kind of a, a sort of mystical old religion that sort of pops up to destabilize things. And when they were in charge, it doesn't seem like things were, were particularly stable and, and well governed. Was the Empire not just trying to provide, what was it Margaret Thatcher used to say, the, the smack of, of firm government? <laughs> maybe, maybe that's what, what was going on. Um, so that's that's another reading to uh, another way to think about this. There's also kind of the libertarian view in which in which the empire does again become the bad guys, but largely because they're they're just trying to control people, and and the empire is to libertarians s sort of again the American government, but not in the way that Lucas meant it. It's it's just like meddling government that doesn't give people a sphere of of personal autonomy. Um, so I, I I don't have the decisive answer for you as to how the Star Wars universe d works. I'm not sure Lucas did. Um, at the time, <laughs> but but I think there there there's some of the ways that we could think about it. That's where I've come come down to, Stephen. On this is here I am. I don't know what it was like for George Lucas to try to get this vision of his made, and there are many many stories, um, including a wonderful podcast about it about about the making of. But the whole idea of well, he's a filmmaker. He's doing what American graffiti, and he's got this idea, and he's putting it together. Why is it fair for me? to say, well, you should have had a fully fleshed out system, like a graduate level system of interplanetary governance and, and structures. Come on, that that's a lot of lore to expect somebody to build into their film when they don't know that they'll get past one movie. They don't know if they'll get through one movie, but they don't know if they'll be able to ever make a second one, much less nine, much less Star Wars stories for Rogue One and Solo and Mandalorian TV shows. There was none of that in the mid seventies. He's writing this. He it's unfair to say that he should have paid attention in all of his political science classes and worked out exactly what happened in political crises that led to this state of governance. Um, I still would like it though, right? I still want it to make sense because there is such an interesting set of characters and circumstances and worlds that I want it to be more like Game of Thrones, which George Martin did do some of that thinking. He was much more aware of what was necessary for this world to make sense over time and perhaps spend too much time on it, given how long it's taking him to finish the damn novels. But clearly there's a payoff for some readers and watchers of the TV show um, with Game of Thrones that I get the political circumstances behind it. And I can see some episodes, not just about the ethical decisions of the characters, but about the very structures of politics and how they lead to those horrible positions for the characters themselves. Yeah, and Matt Madden uh, was a was a sort of student of history, and you know he'd studied kind of um, uh, the War of the Roses, the uh, you know in in, in England um, was his kind of initial analogy for 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 what was going on there. Um, and Game of Thrones is a it, you know it, it's I think you're right, it's a, it's a good comparison to draw sort of the opposite <laughs> in terms of textual detail and backstory to to Star Wars. I mean, obviously they're in different different media. But but I think you're right that that that, that is the that is a, a very different level of detail that we are provided and and for lovers of Game of Thrones that I think is one of the great attractions that not these characters but these these families these dynasties have huge long and intricately plotted histories and so so everything has a kind of weight and a 
and a heft and a plausibility and a and a believability. And I mean, the Game of Thrones universe is quite sort of interesting um, in that there is no sort of technological development that's going on. I mean, this is a sort of Mal- Malthusian society and and situation. And the, I always get the timelines of these confused, but the the more recent one, the uh, House of the Dragon, is set like hundreds of years before Game of Thrones, the the, the series, and, and nothing is different in, in and nothing has changed in those three hundred years. You know, society is stagnant. Well, Stephen, this has been a great conversation, um, and if listeners have stuck with us for ninety minutes on this, then I'll, I'll I'll point all of them to a few resources, which we'll link to in the show notes. First of all. Your more traditional political science books, uh, The Blair Identity, and also Leaders in Conflict. But then two books you've written that have to do with these intersections between pop culture and international relations and political science. One, Otherworldly Politics, The International Relations of Star Trek, Game of Thrones, and Battlestar Galactica, as well as the more recent one, Imagining Politics, Interpretive or Interpretations in Political Science and Political Television. So plenty to read about. But before we close, I do need to ask you another question because we have our chatterbox and it is curious. Let us see. What book or books are on your nightstand or on your list of audible books coming up? Um, So I use a Kindle, so I I guess it is on my nightstand (laughs) at various points. Um, I'm reading at the moment, so I'll give you what I'm reading and what I'm going to read next. I'm reading at the moment a book called Children of Time. I believe so. This is a trilogy of books. I believe, and I'm reading the final one. I believe that's what that's what it's called. But they all have similar titles. And the author's name, I'm pretty sure, is Andre. T- it's not Tarkovsky because that's a famous director, but it's very close to you know. I'm I'm blocking on the on on the name. But Children of Time trilogy um, is the one that that will get you in the right place. And this is a fascinating series of novels that posits an expansive human civilization. It's science fiction, <laughs> an expansive human civilization that has. Um, introduced uh, kind of through genetic engineering new abilities to um, common creatures like spiders and octopus, uh, octopi, no one ever knows the plural of that, um, to, to the point that these have become sentient species with their own worlds. Um, and it's just sort of a fascinating uh, uh, trilogy of books. So the, so the trilogy that ends with uh, with Children of Time is, is what I'm finishing off at the moment. And then I'm going to read Cormac McCarthy's Blood Meridian, after that, uh, and Cormac McCarthy recently died, and I, you know, I've read some McCarthy and seen some of the film adaptations. I, I loved The Road. Um, you know, he's kind of post-apocalypse thriller, and I, yeah, I, I, re- I became a father a couple of years ago myself, and The Road really, you know, hits differently. Uh, it's about a father and a son trying to survive after a terrible catastrophe. Really hits differently um, after you've had a child, and uh, you know, I'm really looking forward to getting into uh, Blood Meridian, which I think is is sort of considered McCarthy's you know, one of his masterworks. Absolutely. Thank you for being so generous with your time and sharing with us your insights on both ways of structuring thought about politics and international relations, uh, but also all of the time you've put in to watching all of these shows and films. We appreciate it. Yeah, no worries. All of the time when I should have been working, some would say, but I would say it's it's real work. And thank thank you. I've really enjoyed being on the podcast. That was Chatter, a production of Lawfare and Goat Rodeo. Please subscribe to the podcast and find us on Twitter at That Was Chatter.